Grab your bone saws, Wargamers, because today we are dealing with the aftermath of the Battle of Silcock Farm. Fought in the last episode of The Joy of Wargaming, we now have to deal with that tragic moment when the thunder of guns has been silenced and no longer echoes through the hills. The moans of the wounded echo instead in the cries of the carrion birds as they prepare their feast. If you didn't see that battle or you didn't want to watch that video, essentially what happened is a vastly overwhelmed Red Force, the Sinistraeans, tried to hold a line of hills that uh, blocked the passage to the capital of Leftopolis and were soundly defeated while inflicting possibly minimal casualties on the invading Dextrans. With a strong punch up the center and a strong, well-defended uh, battery on the Dextran right, the only real success that the Sinistrians saw was a resounding defeat for the Dextran heavy cavalry on the Dextran left. The leader of the Sinistrians was caught alone, and he fled the battlefield en route. They are very close to the capital of Leftopolis, so they do have a fairly open route of retreat. Since we are going through the solo wargaming guide, we'll take a look at what they have for logistics and attrition. And the answer is not a whole lot. They do have a little bit on supply. They have a little bit on casualties. And I appreciate having this information on hand because I'm using... William Sylvester's excellent book for things, for, for essentially the historical details that I just don't have the time or, or gumption to go dig up on my own. It's a very gamey situation in that every single one of these regiments is composed of 750 men. Is that realistic? Uh, probably not. They all have five companies of 150 men. That's very consistent. In the armies of the day, armies today even, you cannot count on 100% of the men being capable of, of being ready for battle when you need them. In fact, I marched these guys all over the continent. You know, they spent three weeks on, on march and probably should have included some rest days. I'm going to try to include that moving forward. Neither side got an advantage out of that, I don't think. I mean, strategically, you could probably argue that as the invaders moving as quickly as possible, the Dextrans got some small advantage, but, I, you know, that's past. We're, we're learning, and we'll get better in the next battle. For now, the important thing to be aware of is that, yeah, this is a little bit gamey. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. It's, guess what we're doing? We're playing a game. It's to be expected it's going to be a little bit gamey. And I do appreciate that William Sylvester includes... An example of how casualties work, but it's not great because there's a lot more that goes into casualties than just, um, you know, what, what do we have here? Uh, marching, you know, 5% casualties or whatever. So to that end, to figure out what the ultimate end of this battle is, I'm going to turn my attention towards Tony Bath's excellent book, Ancient War Games. And in that book, he adds additional flavor that deals with the fact that you have an army that may have retreated in good order. It may have been routed. You may have a cavalry group that is capable of screening your retreat, which the Sinistrians do. You may have cavalry who are capable of continuing pursuit long after the poor ground-pounding infantry have gone uh, exhausted and fallen by the wayside. He also offers some guidance on what to do with, it, with um, uh, what do you call the big shooty guns? Artillery. So we're going to go through that process for both the winners and losers, and I'm going to draw more on Tony Bath than on William Sylvester. One of the things that I did is I actually prepared a roster of each of these armies. The Dextrans had the Royal Army under General Johann von Scar, and you, as you can see here in this list, I hope it shows up. Maybe I can brighten this up a little bit and shift her down. 
I have several regiments of foot and a light cavalry who saw no action or experienced no gunfire. I'm, for the sake of continuing this campaign, they are still fighting at 100% capacity. The letter D indicates that the 4th Autumn Front Infantry ended the battle disrupted. The X is, shows that the Autumn Guard, Heavy Cavalry Unit, was destroyed, functionally destroyed in the tabletop battle. And then we have the 1st Royal Artillery which was pinned at the end of the battle, and the second Royal Artillery was disrupted. And disrupted means that, essentially, they routed a full move back. They took enough casualties to lose their nerve and get away. Likewise with the 4th Autumn Front. I should probably write Autumn Front. That's the town that this regiment was raised from. Their starting strength is 750, and we need to figure out, what does this mean? Well, destroyed means it was destroyed as a fighting force in that battle. Not necessarily that every single one of the 750 men and their horses were shot. So, to this end, this is where we look to Tony Bath. And Tony Bath says, you're going to experience about 25% casualties. What I have done to help personalize my solo wargaming campaign here is to ensure that there is a way to link what happens at the tactical level to what happens at the strategic level. And to that end, any unit that ends a game pinned will be considered to have lost 5% of their number dead and 5% wounded. We should talk about what wounded means. Wounded will recover after two weeks. They can return to service after two weeks. If you control the battlefield, if you retreat, if you're routing from the battlefield, then you, then you have to leave your wounded behind. And those wounded become captured by the enemy or are effectively out of the campaign. If there's a lot of those, we may need to think about what it means logistically for a victor to have to deal with all of these walking wounded. It may actually lead to some Pyrrhic victories where... Congratulations, you won the battle, but you lose a full regiment because you're going to need those guys to escort the, the enemy wounded and captured back to the nearest uh, you know, base camp settlement, what have you. Uh, disrupted, any unit that is disrupted at the end of a game is going to be considered to have 10% dead and 10% wounded, and any unit destroyed is going to have a quarter of the number dead and a quarter of their number wounded. The reason for doing this is that then the big checkpoint here is going to be 75% effective. If you have a unit that is at less than 75% effectiveness, they can no longer fight until they bring their numbers back up, either through replacements, which I think will draw from the, the nearby militia, or from the wounded coming back into service. And this is going to work out really well, because what it means is that any unit destroyed on the tabletop battle is two out of the campaign for two weeks while waiting for those wounded to recover. If you end the game disrupted, then 10% of the people that have been there are dead and 10% wounded. So you have a serious reduction in strength, but you are still classified as uh, an effective unit. You get disrupted twice, or you get pinned and disrupted in subsequent battles within the same two weeks, now you're also going to be out of the fight. So that's the rules that we're going to use for actual casualties. And uh, let me pull this out so we can go back to our army roster. We're not doing Black Raven right now. What that means is that the 4th Autumn Front was disrupted, and so they are going to have 10% of the number killed. So they've got 75 killed, and they've got 75 wounded. They are going to be attacking. They're only going to have a strength of... And we'll actually add a little column here for effectives at 600 for the next battle. And we'll put a note here that 75 wounded will return on return on uh, the battle took place on the 19th. So that's going to be uh, after two weeks. It'll be November. It's 31 days. It's 12. November 2nd. So they can still fight. And if they fight a battle within those two weeks and they lose additional men, we'll have to make a note about when they will return as well. Because if they lose one more guy, 
well, I shouldn't say one more guy. Uh, the break point is 563. If they lose 40 more men, they're not going to be able to fight anymore. And the nice thing is that the math stays consistent for both, uh, for the second Royal uh, Artillery Battery. No, that's not true. It doesn't. It doesn't. This, these only have 150 men, so if they lose 10%, they're going to lose 15 guys dead and 15 guys wounded, leaving them at 120 effectives again the 15 wounded return on 11-2. Uh, pinned over here, uh, the second artillery lost a total of five men. Uh, five percent is, no, I got that backwards. It's going to be uh, seven men and seven men, putting them at an effectiveness of 136. Close enough. And those seven men uh, return on the second. So what we're looking at here is that for the number of guns that we're, we're working with here, if you assume that there's ten men operating a gun, now that includes the five men, you know, you've got, well, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Call it 15 guns per artillery battery. Every time you end a battle pinned, you're going to lose about a gun's worth of effectiveness. And if you're down by, what did I say, 15 guns, if you're down by a quarter, if you're down by four, you're down to 10 guns. Yeah, I, that may be a little, but whatever. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Don't, we don't want to get too lost in the weeds here. The big damage here is going to be that the Autumn Guard, the heavy cavalry, lost a full quarter of their force. Um, and that is going to be... If you run the numbers, you'll find that they lost 188 brave souls have gone to their eternal reward. With 188 additional men who are recovering, and we'll make that same note, 188 wounded return on November 2nd. So their fighting effectiveness is now at 375, which means they are out. I'm going to put a little star here to remind me that the Autumn Guard will not be available moving forward for the next battle. Uh, fairly high butcher's bill here. It looks like we lost a total of almost 300 men from the Royal Dextran Army. Things are worse for the Sinistrians. If we run through the numbers here, what we find is... Let's go ahead and put these side by side. The Sinistrians on the left as usual. Looks like the Sinistrians only lost 200 men, so they were able to inflict additional casualties compared to those lost by the, the Dextrans. However, here you're looking at 200 out of a grand force of about 3,200. Here you're looking at 300 out of a grand force of 6,300. So, much higher casualty rate suffered by the Sinistrians and they flee back to the capital. That's how we do casualties. That's how we do our post-battle wrap-up. But there's again, there's a little bit more to it than that. Because we also have to look at the fact that... And, and I may wind up increasing the casualties done by the Sinistrians. Because we have to look at the actual mechanics of how they left the battlefield. A little bit of non-linear editing here. I have to go back and make sure that I did everything properly. When I was filling out my diary, what happened on the 19th, the Battle of Silcock Farm, I realized, oh, I, almost, I completely forgot. The Sinistrian forces were driven from the field. All of these wounded are now captured and will not return until replacements are made available. So I'm going to make that change, and I'm going to continue with the fact that artillery, it's a lot harder to route with giant one-ton cannons when all you have is literal horsepower to do that job. So uh, they lost, um, we've got 30 killed, 30 wounded. Um, I'm going to declare that you know every 15 men per gun means that this 15-gun battery lost four of its guns. So they're going to take nine guns back with them to Leftopolis. They'll be able to retreat with those. Um, going into the night. But that that means that this is wrong, and I'm going to make that change, and that will have a ro role to play in the next video where we go through the Siege of Leftopolis. So, it, there's probably not going to be good, a smooth transition after this edit, because I'm adding this later. Forgive me.
But before that awkward edit, one minor detail. What I'm going to do is declare that the Autumn Guard survivors, that's the heavy cavalry that were destroyed, there are still a total of 375 effective cavalrymen. We're going to put them in charge of escorting the wounded and the prisoners back to Palestead. So while they are out of the fight, for now, they do have the opportunity after two weeks of returning to battle. And in the meantime, we'll make Palestead the, essentially the concentration area for prisoners captured in the first Elopation War. Moving on. Essentially, what we are looking to do as the solo wargamer is come up with an, with, with an impartial judgment for how bad the loss really was. We've got to weigh a couple of factors. Uh, on the one hand, as mentioned before, the Sinistrians, the, the, they, their ca cavalry suffered no casualties. So they are able to provide a reliable screening force that will mitigate the hazards of additional, say, desertions or the enemy cavalry riding down, routing and fleeing soldiers. They started off knowing that they were going to die. So if this had been a fair fight, the Sinistrians might suffer from a reduced morale. If they had been caught in a really bad position, they might have, but because they knew what they were up against and they always knew they were a delaying force looking to inflict some casualties, I think what we could do, and they are, they are only 10 miles out of a reliable bolt hole, I think what I'm going to do, now, in, in some circumstances, I might triple or even quadruple the losses that the Sinistrians suffer. In this case, I think what we're going to do is... Uh, because of the, the just pure shellacking that the battery received, um, I think, you know, I got this wrong, didn't I? Uh, these guys were disrupted, so they only lost 15 and 15. i got to be careful with my math here. Um, that's going to be 15 recover. I, I'm inclined to uh, declare that they abandoned their guns, and I think what we'll do is we'll double the casualties suffered by this artillery battery and that takes them down to 120 percent effectives which is right at that 75 mark is that right no no i take it back this is 60 out of action out of the 150 so they're no longer available to fight as a functioning force either uh, and we'll put a little star there just to i should really probably put a skull but it takes too long to draw so that's where we're at. Um, the next thing we're going to do is take a look. Before we close the book on this sad, sorrowful day where we are digging a fresh, well, now it turns out it's, oh no, it's about 300 graves. Uh, while the uh, bone saws are, are busy hacking away at unsalvageable limbs, before we bring the sun down on this tragic 19th of October, let's look at the strategic situation and see where things stand. Uh, the Battle of Silcock Farm is done, and the... Ah, so here's another question. Do the victors pursue the routing army to the walls of Leftopolis, or do they wait, recover their dead? Normally, I would say... Now, I don't know what it should be. We've got our three different ways of doing this. right? Using the scammer. Old William Sylvester's, um, uh, call it AI, if you will, you develop three strategies. Now, normally what happens is a general will pursue his orders until he uh, achieves his goal, and then you have to set up three new, uh, three new strategies for him to follow and roll the dice. Going to tweak this a little bit. You have a large army that just won a victory. His orders are to take Leftopolis. So, the other thing to consider is that the Battle of Silcock Farm ended by lunchtime. There are still six hours of daylight in which to, A, now this advantages the retreaters who can get back to Leftopolis under, cover, under the daylight. Uh, it is to the advantage of the invaders, however, because 
they can take the rest of the 19th to recover their dead, set up the hospitals, and they can immediately set out on the 20th and invest Leftopolis. Siege begins on, and I'll write this out, siege begins on 1020. Well, on 1020, their reinforcements, if you will, are capable of marching on good weather. Wait a minute, is it good weather? We have to go to the weather chart and find out what it looks like, both in the north and the south. And if I wanted to be really cheeky, I could roll different dice. So if we have worse weather up here than down here, it gives them more time, the army group south time, to march on Fourth Right City. But it's just fairly small. This map is about the size of South Carolina, so I just roll one time. And in October, we roll 2d6, and the weather is a number four. It's going to be clear skies. So on good roads, army group, Two is going to be able to march 15 miles, that's three quarters of an inch along there, and Army Group South is going to arrive in Talberg on the 20th, and I'm actually going to leave them there for a grand total of two days, and those two days will go ahead and roll seven is nothing, and five is nothing, so we got clear skies, and by the 20, 21, that means they're going to, uh, Army Group 2 is going to arrive in Timberbrook on the 23rd as well. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. These armies are wheeling. In the next episode, we're going to run through the siege of Leftopolis. But I wanted to give you some idea of where these armies are at and how far away they are from, from achieving their goals. As you can see, uh, Army Group 2 is going to join the siege of Leftopolis, if it's not over already, well before... The Army Group South reaches their destination of Fourth Right City. Those are all stories for another day. Tune in, and that other day is like two days away, so make sure you're here for it. Until then, remember, I'm praying for you.